Yes, this is the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, a land of song and laughter, a tiny bit of the United States in the warm seas of the Atlantic and the Caribbean. It all adds up to the kind of vacation you'll never want to win. It's been two painful years since Hurricane Maria swept through Puerto Rico and much of the Virgin Islands. What's changed and what hasn't? And what do the rest of us have to learn from Puerto Rico? Here to sort all that out are Rosa Clemente and Ed Morales. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Ed Morales, the author of Latinx and Living in Spanglish, is just out with a new book that looks at the difference all this has made, specifically on the cherished belief that many Puerto Ricans have held that being a U.S. territory would bring protection, development, and a piece of the American dream. The reality behind that fantasy is at the heart of Ed Morales' very personal as well as political new history book, Fantasy Island, Colonialism, Exploitation, and the Betrayal of Puerto Rico. Today on the show, Ed's joined by another return guest to this program, Puerto Rican activist Rosa Clemente. Rosa spent much of her summer in San Juan as that city erupted into sustained protests against corruption and gender violence. And this August, those protests resulted in the ouster of Governor Ricardo Rosselló and his replacement, after the intervention of the Puerto Rican Supreme Court, with Wanda Vasquez Garced, his former justice minister. Welcome. Thank you for coming back. Um, Rosa, I got to start with you because the last time I was looking at you in a sort of semi-studio where we were talking right after Hurricane Maria, your hair was on fire. You were just back from the island. You were saying we're looking at a Puerto Rico for finance and not for people. What does it look like now? Yeah, I mean, I, I still believe that the ultimate goal will be to have Puerto Rico, but no Puerto Ricans in it, you know. And, um, and the more these two years have passed, with the work of um, Naomi Klein and um, and 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 Ed and and Yari Mabonija, you know, really kind of laying out what we thought was potentially going to happen, you know. But when you begin to read it and how they've all contextualized it, right, it's it's very real, and. Um, I think there's, we have to understand more that there are a group of particularly young, white, rich men um, that want to try out all this cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and see if Puerto Rico is like the staging ground for that. But with that as well, and I don't think a lot of people still know this, that if you're in Puerto Rico six months plus one day as a U.S. citizen, you don't pay taxes. You know, and um, in fact, yesterday I was reading a story about what's happening in Klingon, which is a, a, one of the most beautiful parts of the island, but surfers from all over the world come there, um, you know, to catch waves and, 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 and have these competitions. And I was just reading an article about how the sewer system in Klingon is so backed up that it's now flowing into the ocean, right? And I mean, that goes to how do people have clean water? Right. Pensions are about to be cut again for those that are receiving pensions. Um, the gender violence keeps increasing. And just two days ago, there was a huge uh, drug deal that happened in one of the housing projects where hundreds of bullets were shot and six people were killed. You know, so yeah, I think this is part of what I would consider ethnic cleansing. Yeah. It also speaks to the fantasy that your whole book is about, that on the one end we can have the sunny surfing while the sewage is pouring out from a lack of infrastructure and investment. Yeah. Talk a bit about what this fantasy has been to you, because this is personal. Yeah. This is <clears throat> family fantasy. Right. Well, I mean, in some ways, like, uh, the narrative is divided between the leftist activist part of, of me, you know, which... and. Nationalists and activists have always known that uh, the, the title that was uh, given to Puerto Rico as a commonwealth or a semi-autonomous state um, that was a functioning democracy and economy was, was a fantasy. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people who knew that was a fantasy all along. But 
when you get to the average Puerto Rican, you know, like my family and some people that I know, you know, they, they really felt like uh, the status was working for them on a certain level. You know, they were able to, you know, uh, have a middle class home and a car and go shopping at malls like you have in the United States. But uh, the economy of Puerto Rico was never self-sustaining. And the government, you know, has been in debt going all the way back to the 70s to ameliorate that. And the government had to become the largest employer. And so when the bottom fell out of the deals they were making through the municipal bond market, which was a lot of tricky stuff that was coming out of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. We should go into in the book. Um, you know, that's when the fantasy started falling apart. And these two twin catastrophes that happened, the, the culmination of the, of the debt and declaring that it was uh, unpayable, and then followed by Maria and the collapse of the electrical infrastructure, um, has had the effect of uh, it's starting to empty the population as well, which goes to Rosa's point yeah. about um, emptying the island of Puerto Ricans. Was it never self-sustaining, never could have been self-sustaining, mm. or was it created not self-sustaining, which is to say dependent? Yes, it was never self-sustaining because, well, first of all, you know, as you know, uh, Puerto Rico was a colony of Spain for 400 years before the United States. And uh, there were collaborators with the Spanish colonialism as well, and they were the ones who had most of the property in the sugar industry. But when the U.S. came in, um, they adjusted the tax laws to favor outside interest, and the U.S. Uh, sugar companies were able to take over most of the best land for sugar. And the U.S. Uh, economy started to dominate the Puerto Rican economy, and it was never really allowed to uh, grow on its own. Uh, you know, the Jones Act making it impossible for uh, free tr uh, for trade to happen. The U.S. set up Puerto Rico as a free trade zone in the early 20th century as a prelude to NAFTA in a way um, by, you know, just there were no duties charged to the U.S. for imports from Puerto Rico. And uh, then the U.S. dumped all of its consumer stuff that it wasn't selling in the U.S. onto Puerto Rico. And just to del delve into the history a tiny bit more, and then we'll come back to you, Rosa. A lot of Americans pretend they understand about the status of Puerto Rico, but we really don't. So it's belongs to, but is really not of. Right. It's a territory. The history that you lay out is very clear. I don't know why it's so poorly understood. Um, talk about the, is it called the Downs Bidwell yeah. case that right. determined the status and, and, the, and contextualized that a little bit for us? Right. You know, what happened in the 19th century with a lot of territories that the U.S. acquired, um, which were put on the road to statehood, like a lot of the places in the middle of the country and in the West, those were uh, thought of as uh, incorporated territories, which meant that they were on the path to statehood. But at the end of the 19th century, when the U.S. decided to start this uh, colonial empire and expand beyond its borders to maybe create a security zone in the Caribbean and to the south, um, they, st you know, fighting the war with Spain, they acquired these territories filled with people who they you know, mistrusted because, or, or were just outright racist towards because they were uh, not white, they were mixed. You know, there's a lot of prejudice against uh, mixed people as well. You know, they yeah. would say things like, mixed people have the worth, worst aspects of both uh, white and black. So they did not uh, consider Puerto Rico or, near the, or the Philippines as candidates for statehood. And they created this new category called unincorporated territory. And Downs, Downs versus Bidwell, which was decided on by the same, well, two of the same Supreme Court judges that decided on Plessy versus Ferguson, which established separate but equal, they said that Puerto Rico was belonging to but not a part of the U.S. And so what that allowed them to do was treat Puerto Rico in, some, in ways that uh, at was advantage to the United States. For instance, they gave Puerto Rico the title of state so that it couldn't declare bankruptcy. They did it that way. But when it was to their advantage to consider Puerto Rico a foreign uh, area, then uh, they, they consider it as foreign. And th that's constantly still being done. How has this played out in your life, Rosa? We always talk politics, but talk personal a little bit. What has this scenario meant for you, your family, your life? Well, you know, I, I grew up in the Bronx, um, very proud to be Puerto Rican. I didn't speak English until I was almost nine. Always went to the island to see my abuela, Titi and Theos. But I, I, it, for me, when I found out what Puerto Rico was really about was in college, right? It, it was like my parents definitely uplifted us culturally in every way as Boricos, period. 
but I had literally had to go to college and open up a book and, and, and show the Puerto Rican history and ask my parents, like, we're a colony or political prisoners or independistas. And, you know, my father was like, growing up there, we knew, but we didn't talk about that. But my father did tell me this interesting story that he was part of a community that the University of Puerto Rico built around. So my father essentially lived inside the University of Puerto Rio, Rio Piedras. <laughs> um, they never told the people they were building it. And when people began to protest, they just said, well, we'll just build it here and you won't have to pay rent or things like that. You know, so the older I've gotten, and especially in the last decade, you know, my father's telling me every story you know, and even my mom is like, well, you know, you say you're an independista at night in a bar. You don't say that outside. You don't represent that because the repression um, on independistas or any leaders on um, that fight for freedom in Puerto Rico was always a deadly, deadly one, you know? So I would say when the hurricane hit, though, my parents called and was like, you have, you're going, right? And I said, yeah, you know, I got to raise some money, but I'm going. Um, it was very personal when I got there first because our house in Rio Piedra survived. And my uncle, um, I was asking him about electricity because he worked for Con Edison here in New York City for 40 years. And he said, they're never going to fix this grid. It'll be at least a year before everyone has power. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, if there's no power in New York City for like two days, the apocalypse would like, <laughs> sure. you know, right. a year. And he was completely right. Yeah. Because he said, we've already had these rolling blackouts. The grid is horrible. And he himself said, we can do renewable energy. We're an island. Yeah. We have sun. Like, we can do this. Um, but then when I visited my titi in the hospital in Bayamón, at first, they weren't letting anybody go in. They were very afraid of infections. And when they let me go in, I had to put on like a hazmat kind of suit so not to get other people sick. And she was in so much pain because um, she lost everything in the house and had broken her leg. She had an infection. And the nurse said, at this time, we're only doing surgeries to save people's lives right now. So the part that my aunt was in was where eventually people would have to have amputations because mm. they didn't even have medicine to stop the infection, right? So it's real, it's, yeah. it's visceral. Um, the older I've gotten, I understand exactly what Puerto Rico is um, and, and the colonial status. Also been very lucky that a lot of our Puerto Rican former political prisoners are here. Oscar's still here, Rafael Cansan Miranda's here, mm -hmm. you know, and, and seeing him in Puerto Rico, Rafael was like, it's just the next stage of struggle. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I got there in July and saw the unity of various different Puerto Ricans, you might believe in statehood, independence, colonial, you might have been gone from the island, you might be coming back to the island from, from here in the United States. It was like that moment I always prayed for. I was like, oh, this is it. Because the goal to get Jose Joe to resign mm -hmm. was primary. It reminded me of the, the, the struggle around Vieques. At one point, everybody might have had a different political solution, but we knew immediately that Vieques has to, we have to stop it from be, being a bombing range. The, and that's, US, the U.S. base that the Navy was using right, for, for weapons testing. And on May 1st, 2003, that victory happened and the U.S. Navy left. Now, to this day, they've never cleaned it up. And at the moment, Vieques doesn't have a hospital. So anybody that gets sick in Vieques has to go to Far Hardo. But when I was at those protests, to see the amount of young people to see LGBTQ trans Puerto Ricans, to see anarchist leaning young people, to see feminists. And, and what was really amazing about that whole time was there was never a politician who spoke. You know, like here in the United States, you go to like these pre-planned events and seven people speak and you march with the police and then you leave. 
No, I mean, even walking through old San Juan, they had changed all the names of the streets, like put tags over mm. them. Like, this is not Calle Fortaleza, now this is Calle Libertad. It was like a new kind of nationalism for me. It was like an intersectional nationalism because a lot of the failings of nationalism in the past has been, has been too patriarchal, male-dominated. And so this inclusivity of women and, uh, who were at the forefront and uh, LGBTQ people, I thought was really um, encouraging and a model for what could happen in the U.S. or what is sort of happening in the U.S. a little bit. Um, but it was, everyone was united at the same time by this pride for, for Puerto Rico, but also uh, with, the, uh, with the feeling that their, their individual uh, marginalization and struggle was also being recognized, which I thought was uh, really positive. But one thing that I feel disappointed about is that the tech scandal, which is one of the reasons for the whole outburst of emotion, which was very justified, um, did not reveal enough, you know, there wasn't enough work shown to reveal mm -hmm. the con corruption that was happening in the government because there was all this evidence of the people around Rosario, um, you know, fixing, rigging all the contract and, and a lot of investigation was not done. And you have Wanda Vasquez who, you know, has a very uh, negative record on a lot of uh, issues for people in Puerto Rico running the government. So this, um, yeah. I mean, this again is not unique to mm. Puerto Rico that we see a scandal around an important thing, yeah. gender violence. Those yeah. texts were horrendous. What the former governor Rosario yeah. had to say, but not necessarily getting to the systemic issues. Is right. there a chance that this whole Ricky Resign movement? could stay focused on the systemic mm -hmm. corruption that you're talking about and well, maybe the direction of development for the island? I think what a lot of people don't know is that before that, five days before the FBI indicted Julie Keller, the Secretary right. of Education, and her entire staff for corruption, for stealing. Julie Keller is the one that gave the go-ahead to close over 200 mm -hmm. schools in Puerto Rico. So where was all that money going to? Was being funneled through 11 different LLCs that she has. She also has ties to Betsy DeVos, right? So it's like you peel one layer and you're like, okay, right, and then this, and do we want a governor that's gonna still represent the same type of corruption? And, and recently also um, Wanda Vasquez had to declare a national emergency around gender violence because it's the highest um, in the Western Hemisphere right now, Puerto Rico has the highest rates of murder of women and it's been exacerbated mm. post the hurricane. And she also talked at least about a debt reduction plan, but that seems to be going nowhere. Well, because I, I believe we don't, we don't uh, yeah. my, my line is we don't owe a penny. The, the, the case yeah. of the the, of the um, oversight board that yeah. is administering so-called this debt right. um, came before the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. And the decision was to basically maintain the status quo? Well, they haven't made the decision yet, but like most observers feel that the way the arguments went, that it didn't look like they were going to um, uh, invalidate the appointments of the oversight board and leave it the, the and way And why it is this such a big deal? Because there's a lot of money on the table for the people who want to collect the debt. Um, the, in fact, this whole thing is being rushed through. Like one of the things I talk about in the book is that PROMESO <coughs> itself, the Which was act the debt deal. for the debt restructuring, was rushed through in record time during what most people consider to be a no, you know, no, uh, no action Congress. And suddenly there is this bipartisan uh, bill that was pushed through. Um, the rhetoric was continually saying that there was no time left and this had to be pushed through. And then also, when the, uh, second, the First Circuit uh, Appeals Court uh, ruled that uh, the appointments of the, uh, the Oversight Board may have been unconstitutional, they also rushed to get this new debt restructuring deal done in the summer knowing that uh, they may, you know, that they, it's possible that the work of the Board would be invalidated by the Supreme Court. I mean, we see now that <clears throat> it seems like they never really were going to do that in the first place, but they did put together this deal, and um, it does uh, cut pensions uh, by 15% uh, for people who are getting over $1,200 a month and will probably, uh, you know, incur more austerity measures. So people in Puerto Rico are calling for an independent audit of the debt. Um, as Rosa said, you know, the, most of the debt could be found to be illegal. 
Also, these Colombia economists say that uh, for Puerto Rico to have a functioning economy, at least 85% of the, of the debt should be dispensed with or forgiven in some way. So really, Puerto Rico is doomed to be in uh, debt slavery, really, for the next 40 years. Oh, but I'm not, that's, so yeah. not, that's so not on brand for the Laura Flanders show. Puerto <laughs> Rico is doomed. <laughs> <laughs> the the right. last time we were on, we well, were saying, oh, there are um, other models of development. Unless and, the board is overturned by a people's yeah. movement. you know. Or the well, board, so, yeah. okay, grasping at straws here. <laughs> Ricky resigned mm -hmm. that movement, intersectional, perhaps for the first mm -hmm. time, at least yeah. in certain ways, yeah. um, powerful enough to oust this governor, mm -hmm. although maybe not get to the heart of everything. What happens to it now? Well, what has been happening, I think also that the intersection of particularly young black Puerto Ricans taking leadership, you know, affirming who they are, I think that's always an important step towards liberation. And, and we're seeing that really play out culturally and politically on the island, which is exciting. And now they have been having people's assemblies you know, there's even people who are rewriting what a Puerto Rican constitution can look like. For me, those are signs of empowerment. Uh, they're signs that saying we can no longer depend on some governmental structure or an elected official, right? right? Um, and we've done stories about the free schools that developed in the course of the uh, closing of all those schools. We talked last time you were on about Casa Pueblo, a sort of self-sustaining green power run community. Finca Vieques. Um, also, uh, uh, Comerio is a place that um, Defend Puerto Rico has been working on, just rebuilding houses, like, on their own, you know, from donations from people, but rebuilding house to house. In Luisa right now has really actually come up a little stronger. They were hit with Irma, then Maria, but also Lu Luisa being primarily African descendant has always been neglected by Puerto Rican yeah. leaders. Um, Somebody that's known here in New York, Dr. Maita Morena Vega, just opened up a huge institution there called Afro Corridor, mm. and an arts place, so right, that's good. Samuel Lynch. Thank you, Rosa. You're helping yeah. me with the mood here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because I do want to bring us back also to what Puerto Rico has to teach here. I mean, I look at this and I say, the fantasy of a democracy treating people equally, um, the fantasy that kind of colonial development by corporations and finance will work. Um, climate change and the movement against corruption ousts the governor, pulls together a movement. Um, you write repeatedly in the book that there are ways in which Puerto Rico has been a canary in the coal mine for people in this part of, in, in the U.S. Um, would you read a little part that, that speaks to that? Because over and over again in your book, that comes across. I think this is the right page. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, page 72 it is. There it is. Um, okay. And it speaks to how much better we would be off here if we knew more about what was happening there. Um, even as the real crisis began to snowball in Puerto Rico, it would not become apparent to the United States largely because there has been traditionally almost no media coverage outside of the Laura Flanders show Thank of you. the island outside of the occasional crime wave or hurricane. In fact, Awareness of the crisis would become widespread at first only through the business press, which I had to spend hours going over, which saw a threat to not only American investors, but also the municipal debt market itself. But the mainstream awareness of Puerto Ricans as a people and a nation has created a formidable discourse, one that would emerge suddenly to disrupt the stark silences and, and to directly or indirectly remind America that the loss Wall Street and Congress had worked so hard to externalize will not be shed so easily when the people who must pay for it are not as separate as had been thought. Through the debt crisis, as much as the United States tried to maintain its distance, Puerto Rico would finally become a permanent internal problem. And that really symbolizes how Puerto Rico is a symbol of marginalized communities all over the U.S. and the world. Um, that, uh, you know, the, the debt crisis in Puerto Rico bears a lot of resemblance to the financial crisis of 2008, where they had all of these bad mortgages that they gave to people who couldn't afford to pay them back. It's a very similar mechanism. mechanism. So they really are us. Yes, right. Well, 
I've always been us. <laughs> <laughs> how's, how's your family? <laughs> I'm sorry? How's your family? Oh, uh, well, you know, um, you know, my dad passed away in 2011. I have a thing about the book about how we understood how the electrical grid was going to affect things because we were always having blackouts up in the mountains. And there were times my dad was a, at home for, you know, almost a, over a year um, convalescing, and we had him hooked up to machines that were feeding him through tubes. And we knew that when the power went out, you know, my mom would panic because his respirator, we had to make sure that the plant we had the, to generate electricity was working. But, uh, you know, my mom is, uh, you know, still there. She had to move to the U.S. after the hurricane for a while. Couldn't stand being in upstate New York, had to go back, didn't like the cold weather. And now she's very happy, mm -hmm. like in the community where all the people come by and, and take care of her. I've got to ask you, Rosa, before we go, we've got 10 seconds, but why the shirt? The shirt? Oh, Shirley Chisholm. Um, you know, I, I, I have pretty much lost faith in almost every elected official, even ones that are Puerto Rican, you know. and. Um, I just always think it's important, especially for young people, to know like they're not the first ones to blaze a trail of being an unapologetic elected official. You know, it's and Shirley it's Chisholm was one. Yeah, first black woman to run for president. And if people read a lot of what she said, everything she said is happening, which usually happens with our greatest leaders and historians. Rosa Clemente, thank you for bringing Shirley Chisholm into this conversation. Mm -hmm. Both of you, thank you for your book, Ed. It's beautiful, and Thanks. continue to do the reporting you're doing, Rosa, and we'll continue to play it. Thank you, Laura, for continuing to cover Puerto Rico. Thank you. Mm -hmm.